Um, hi, my name is Julian Mackay. Um, I am located down in Victoria University of Wellington, which is over here. Um, this is some joint work with uh, James Noble, um, who's in the room over here, and then Susan Eisenbach and Sophia Chisopoulou over in Imperial College. This is our paper, Necessity Specifications for Robustness. Um, so just to sort of kind of try and contextualize where we're starting from, or at least um, what is what we juxtapose against is I'll start with sort of fun, what we call what I'm going to call over here functional specifications. Um, so specifications that are trying to express some kind of correctness. So you're all probably familiar or to some degree familiar maybe with something like either a tool like Daphne or maybe something more formal like whole triples, where we're trying to prove some kind of or specify or, and then potentially prove some kind of correctness um, of a function. So typically this is going to be something in a closed world situation. So you know your function, you know all the statements inside of it, you know the functional specifications perhaps of the function calls that your function makes. Um, you want to try, you try to prove um, in a sort of maybe um, general sense that good things will happen, right? So typically you have a precondition. Um, so if you satisfy the precondition, then the postcondition, which says some good things are going to happen, will happen. Um, and this is uh, specifying individual functions, right? So individual behavior from isolated functions often, um, because so the example might be you want to specify your sorting algorithm, and you want to say this sorting algorithm, if you call it with a list, then I'll give you back a sorted list, right? Um, so this is sort of juxtaposed. Um, ooh, is that going to work? There we are. Um, with the sort of topic of our um, system that, uh, which is robustness. So robustness has this sort of, um, has been studied in the literature and has a sort of, um, maybe I'll give an informal definition of, if I have some code, we might want to consider it robust. If uh, it's interactions with the outside world, with unknown actors, potentially malicious, um, doesn't induce it to do something really weird or unexpected, right? We want um, it to not break when, you, when it meets the outside world. Um, so, I've already said some stuff. I said the outside world, so we're talking about the open world. We're talking about many different, um, this is the very the closed world, right? Um, we want to say bad things don't happen. So when I have my code and it touches the outside world, it doesn't break. Um, we want to say what those bad things aren't, uh, or what those bad things are and that they don't happen. And over here, because we want to say bad things don't happen, and bad things can happen through an interaction of many different functions and many different pieces of code, we want to say, we want to talk about emergent behavior of these functions. So many functions, maybe I've got an interface to my module, my library, and we want to interleave maybe a series of function calls. I'm going to say this interleaving doesn't result in, um, in uh, some bad things, let alone a single function call, right? Um, okay, so t traditionally methods can't, uh, traditional methods for sort of specifying, um, your code can't really deal with these emergent, this emergent behavior, um, typically. Um, and so this is, this is kind of the target of our work. We, uh, we want to look at how to specify and then prove um, properties of robustness um, that take into account this emergent behavior. Um, uh, okay, so moving on to an example, starting slow, uh, pretty concrete um, starting point. Um, Suppose I've written this banking software. Uh, we've got a, an account. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's got a balance, it's got a password, and it's got a transfer function. It doesn't do anything particularly special. The transfer function just is used. Give it the right password, you'll reduce your balance, right? Um, we don't actually at the moment have any way to put money in, but you can take money out. Um, OK, so if we wanted to maybe write a, some kind of uh, correctness specification for this, we might say, Typically, here's a precondition. This is just some syntax I've um, made up uh, for this talk. It might be some syntax somewhere out there, but um, don't look too deep into it. So if you give the right password, then it will reduce the balance, right, by the amount you specify. Um, so it's correct, and this is a valuable thing to know. But the question we would ask is, is it robust? Is there some way to induce uh, or to illicitly um, steal our money, right? Um, so I guess what I mean by that is, if you don't know the password, if you aren't me, can you take my money? Um, 
What a, so over here, this is pretty simple. There's only one function. You can kind of, by inspection, see that this is pretty safe um, because there's no way to steal the password or, and you need to know the password in order to get the money. But what happens if my colleague comes along, we're developing this banking software, and they make an extension to our code base, and they add this, they're like, here's a new feature, allows to set the password, and they write this horrible function at the bottom there that allows you to just reset the password without any guards or any checks. Um, I would say that this is open the door to a bad thing happening. Um, so this is maybe what we want to avoid. Um, and, for, and as a result, we're going to end up bad bank. Um, what about now? I Maybe I noticed this bug, and I come along and I fix it. Is, um, is this robust? So now we've got a slightly more complex interface, and, and this is the sort of question we need to answer. And this is the first thing that I'm going to talk about, which is what we do, or what we're trying to do, is we're trying to develop a specification that differentiates between these three different uh, bank versions of bank, right? Um, and in order to do this, we need to consider the emergent behavior. So uh, if you look at bad bank over here, this isn't just the behavior of one function behavior of two functions, you can't steal the money with any one function call. Um, so, um, so let's define like a necessity specification uh, called next spec over here that will maybe try and specify the kind of behavior we want and exclude the behavior we don't want. So if we have an account A, um, and our syntax um, is at the bottom, so from account A with a balance bell, um, if the balance decreases, so if at any point in the future, over an arbitrary number of execution steps, the balance is reduced, then we can conclude that somebody at the current point in time um, must know, somebody outside of us, somebody out, somebody out there in the world must know our password. And that's the, that's, um, that kind of does the job, right? It excludes, um, and we can look at how this uh, does it, but one thing to note before I apply, uh, go back and look at our banks is, that NextBank is actually agnostic with respect to the interface bank, right? It doesn't make any references to um, any functions. It only says that a account has a password and a balance, um, and that it makes no mention of um, any. Doesn't doesn't mention the transfer uh, method. It doesn't um, mention any uh, the set password method or any other methods. It also doesn't mention any other classes within our bank module. It only says that um, the account that you need to have the part, somebody out there must have the password in order to steal our money. This may seem trivial, but actually it's really good because it keeps it really general and it captures the, the property we're trying to um, specify. Okay, so um, going back up to look at our banks, uh, clearly our original bank does satisfy this, um, this specification. And that's purely because it's such a simple um, class, right? Single function. Um, Next, um, bad bank clearly doesn't. You don't need to know the password um, in order to drain the bank. If you have uh, access to my account, you can just reset the password to whatever you want and take all my money. Um, better bank does. And uh, at this point, we can do this by inspection because these things are relatively simple. Um, but now let's look at what I've, hopefully I've given a sort of intuition for what our um, specifications mean, what they, they're doing. Um, but I'll give maybe a bit, more, uh, a bit more detail on the actual semantics of this. So um, what this means is when we start in a, if we start in a program state, call it sigma original, um, where we have an account A with a balance bell, if after any arbitrary number of execution steps, we end up in a sigma new, so some new program state, where the balance has been reduced, then that means that the in the original uh, program state, there must have been some object out there that had a, some external object to us that had access to the password. Okay, so I've probably said a lot of words that don't really make any sense, um, and I'll maybe I'll, I'll sort of detail uh, all the contributions of our um, specifications. So. These are our specifications. Um, they sort of exist on these two levels. So first off, we have our assertions, A. Um, and these things have a lot of the same things that you might expect in like a normal assertion um, uh, language where you have um, some expressions, some equality, some field accesses, um, some conjunctions, disjunctions, quantifiers, existential, you know, existential universal quantification. Uh, but it's also got these interesting things. Um, so what we call permission. 
Um, so this is x has access to y. And what this means is that y is a field of x, right? There's some field inside of x that, is, that points to y, or y exists inside of the local variable map of a currently executing um, uh, method inside of x. Um, next is provenance. Um, so this is where, where our objects come from. Uh, you've already seen external, but we also have internal. So external um, merely says this is something not created by us. It comes from the outside world. Um, and internal means it's something that's created by us, and we know what it is, and we know everything that goes into it, right? Um, then we have, finally, we have controls, or control, which is calls. Um, so this is, merely says that in the current program state, we have a, um, the, there's a currently executing method of x, and that, is, that calls y.m. Right? So we need this in order to start reasoning about the interface of our, of our library or module code. Okay, so then we exist on this, I mentioned two levels. We have this other form specification, S, where, which is our necessity specifications. And so these have different forms. First we can say something is invariant. So something is just generally provably true. Um, well, not necessarily provably, I guess, but it just generally true. Um, then we can say, um, something that you've already seen before, the necessary precondition, which says if you start in, a, in an original state, get to some new state, then A necessary must have been true in order for that transition to, to occur. Uh, we have a variation on that, which is our um, single step necessary precondition, which if you remember previously, the top one over there, or the middle one, I guess, is, um, is uh, it takes account an arbitrary number of execution steps. This is a single execution step. Um, and then finally, we have necessary intermediate conditions. So this is, um, for us to go from our original program state to our new program state, there must be some intermediate program state where a necessary was true. And it's worth noting that that intermediate actually could be the start or the end. Um, okay, so that, that sort of enumerates what we have in our specification language. And you can see that we've already been able to express something relatively complex, something relatively high level about our, our banking software. Um, and what we kind of like about this, uh, and I feel like this is a point which we're kind of proud of, is we feel we've hit this sort of sweet spot between um, some kind of expressiveness where we're able to express some relatively interesting properties of software, um, and we, are, we have a proof logic for it. We can prove it. Um, which, so just to give a bit of history, we, a couple of years ago, we were working with something a lot more expressive, which had um, operators that resembled a lot of sort of temporal logic operators. You had futures, pasts, previous, next, um, that sort of stuff. Um, and what we found was actually it's really hard to um, create constructive proof logic about this. And so we tried to target um, the kinds of properties we were trying to specify and write something a bit more uh, tractable in constructing a proof logic. And this is what we ended up at. Um, so this is a nice transition as well to the next uh, portion of the talk, which is how do we prove these things? Um, well, um, our proof for um, what we're trying to prove are these necessary preconditions. Um, and there are five core ideas or central components to our, the way we construct our proofs. Um, so the first idea is that um, this necessary precondition that we really should be relatively familiar with through this talk so far is actually equivalent to this, right? A potentially infinite con uh, conjunction of statements wrapped in a whole triple, so which basically we're saying is for any set of statements, if you start in a program state um, where A original is true and you want to end up in a program state where A new is true or valid, then you must have started in a program state where A necessary was valid. Um, so that's that sort of uh, defines how our thinking about these things is. Um, so that, that leads us on to the next idea. Um, so the second idea is, um, okay, so we've talked about the open world and the closed world. There are things we know and the, the code that we've written and the code that we don't know and we can't specify and we can't say anything about. So what we can say things about is our own code and um, over here M is potentially, is a function that we've written and we can specify that. And actually, similar to this, um, in a much more smaller sense, this um, will, we'll, sorry, 
um, drop your head. So this is actually provable from this functional specification of M, right? And what I mean to say is that actually, um, if you have a precondition and a postcondition on your M, so this is a function, remember, we have written, so we can, there are many methods out there to prove these, um, these sorts of pre and post conditions. Um, this very fine grained version of a necessary precondition is actually equivalent to um, our whole triple at the bottom there. Okay, um, and now the third idea, which I promise they'll all glue together in the end, um, is we note that actually there are some assertions out there that can only be invalidated by us, right? So if you think about a language um, with like private fields, like in Java, where you um, perhaps modifying a field can only occur by us, well, only we can do it. Um, if you don't have access to it, but um, just something, certain, under certain circumstances, only we can give you access, right? And so this is actually quite a powerful um, idea for us um, because it says that, um, um, if we can identify what encapsulated uh, assertions are, then we need only inspect our own module code, right? Um, so if you know what assertions are, if you can prove an assertion is encapsulated by M, you need only to know, uh, prove specifications on methods in M. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is the fourth idea, um, and this is the thing that sort of glues all of the last three ideas together. Um, so, I mentioned encapsulation, uh, assertion encapsulation. If A original is encapsulated by M, um, and by our, some, our module M, and A new implies an invalidation of uh, our original program state, then, and for all methods within our interface of M, yeah, we can prove that A necessary is a necessary precondition for um, going from A original to A new, then it follows that just by inspecting our code, we know that um, it, it, more generally to go from A original in a single step to A new, you can go to, uh, A necessary as a necessary precondition. Okay, so you can see how we've used the last three ideas, glued them together to get these more general. We're still working on single steps, um, but it turns out you can actually develop then a proof logic based on these um, single step uh, necessary preconditions and sort of built up from functional specs up to uh, our more general emergent specifications of emergent behavior. And so here's a little fragment of our proof, um, proof system. I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, these rules, but there's, then there's a lot more. But suffice to say that we um, ha have a lot more of these rules we're able to express and prove um, interesting um, uh, specifications of emergent behavior. Okay, so take a quick um, uh, check where we, where we sit. So necessity is sound. We have proven it sound. We've proven it sound in cock. Um, and what is quite nice, and we're kind of into, is that it's parametric with respect to uh, how we prove functional specifications. So we don't say you've got to prove it like this or prove it like that. There are many people out there who have, who have um, developed methods for proving functional specifications. We'll let them do that and uh, we'll use their work. Um, and also, assertion encapsulation, we don't say how you can prove that. In the paper, we provide a relatively simplistic um, mechanism for this, uh, which is based on a really simple type system. But you can imagine a more sophisticated version which uses perhaps something like ownership, or perhaps you could develop, um, you know, in, in our wildest dreams, I guess, we have a very sophisticated assertion logic where we can reason about these things on the side. But what we, are, uh, what we say is that if you have your functional specifications and you have whatever mechanism for proving encapsulation, uh, you can glue these things together and get these really nice, really expressive specifications and prove them. Um, and critically, we're able to prove re the robustness of our bank account. So our original example, uh, we can prove robustness of that or by our definition of robustness. And um, more than that, so this is a piece of the paper this is the paper proof, but there is a proof of it in COC. Um, but more than that, we have a more sophisticated version of the account, which has um, which has multiple classes and some ghost fields. We express the, the balance with a ghost field, something a bit more interesting than just a balance uh, field. And we've got a ledger for our bank account. Um, and we have a proof of that satisfaction in COC too. Um, so, 
The other thing we're actually interested in is how expressive are these things. So we've, um, I think, I think that our background example is relatively interesting because it's, well, it's nice and it's elegant. We get this nice elegant um, specification um, to express something quite complex. But we also have uh, got a series of case studies that we have looked at, some exemplars. So um, first off, the DAO, which you, many of you will probably be um, uh, familiar with. Um, so the DAO is this um, smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. And many years ago, I guess it's what, six years ago now, um, somebody ex uh, exploited a reentrancy bug inside of uh, the DAO to drain something like $50 million from it, whatever it was. But, and there are ways to solve this. Um, and we're not claiming that this is the only way to do it. But what we like is that we, um, we give a general uh, specification of this behavior, right? The sort of behavior you actually want and not the sort of localized version which you get from say a functional specification. Um, where essentially we, we can write quite simply as a necessity spec that if you ever, that at no point in, um, uh, no set, over no sys, uh, execution can you ever go from a uh, get to a point where the um, the combined or sorry the balance of of one investor in the DAO is greater than the available ether. And what's interesting over here, two things I think are interesting over here. First off, um, this this also implies that actually the sum of all the the balances ne necessarily has to be um, less than um, the available ether. Um, and secondly, I think it's quite interesting that we're using um, this only if false, which is sort of like a contradiction. Um, you can only get to this point if false is originally true, which is not actually possible to be true. Um, yeah, so the next example is uh, ERC20, which is another um, smart contract. Um, so this is a token standard on the Ethereum blockchain. And um, effectively over here, we're saying, we're sort of reasoning about a similar sort of situation, but we're saying that um, if you if you reduce your balance, then um, some, if somebody's balance ever gets reduced, then it must have been true that they were allowed or uh, had permission to reduce it, right? Um, so this over here is our next one, safe, which is something we um, have come up with. And so this is related to our bank spec in that it is, um, it's actually a, a, like a smaller fragment of the bank spec, which is actually just reasoning about um, what it takes to steal our treasure. And this, this is similar to saying that um, what the specification essentially says is that the only way you can steal the treasure is if somebody actually currently knows our password, which is very similar to our bank specification, but gets rid of the balance um, stuff. Okay, next crowd sale, which um, this is an example we took out of um, this paper over here, Verix, this Verix paper. Um, and this isn't, um, this is merely to show that we can express the specifications that they expressed. So this was CrowdSale is a um, another um, smart contract that um, for a crowd uh, sourcing um, for for some crowdsourcing, which says effectively there's a series of specifications. But the big takeaway is that um, you know if you if if the if the project isn't funded, then all the investors get their money back, and if it is, then the people uh, running the project get the get the money right so it's interesting that we can do it there are some variations because we're using our little toy language whereas they were working on solidity and but we're just showing that we can s express this like similar properties right um and uh next we have the dom so over here um it's uh, we, we've cryptid off this paper over here um dominic in the room over here and um effectively what we're saying is we're trying to express this idea that, okay, so with the DOM, we're trying to protect aspects of the DOM by wrapping it in these proxy objects. Um, so you can see proxy over there. And these proxy objects have a maximum height through which you can traverse, you can use this, um, use these nodes within the within your DOM tree to traverse up the, um, up the tree. And we wanna say that you can never traverse higher than uh, how much you're allowed to. Um, and that's what our specification is expressing. Um, so we've got these case studies, they're all very interesting. Um, and we think that, you know, um, they are, they're really useful to show that actually we can express some really powerful um, ideas in this language. Um, and so in conclusion, concluding out the talk, we 
contain necessity and specification language that is both uh, expressive enough to capture complex robustness properties, as we saw with our um, bank account example. It is provable. We have a proof system of it um, that we've proven sound. And using necessity, we're able to express the robustness properties of, for a collection of exemplar case studies. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? So thank you for the talk. Uh, so this looks very similar to uh, to the incorrect logic uh, uh, argument where you are trying to prove an under approximate property for a given post condition. Can you comment uh, on that? Yeah. So um, just just um, the incorrectness logic. This is this is incorrectness logic. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah it is sort of similar, um, but it's, I think it's sort of doing a slightly different thing, right? This isn't. I think I'd say this is an under approximation, which is what they're doing. This is more just saying that if uh, if you want to get to the state, this is a requirement. Um, this is a necessary requirement. Whereas the um, with incorrectness logic, you're saying, oh, sorry, I've, like every time I take a month to stop thinking about this logic, uh, it like bleeds my head about how it works. But um, the, you're, you're hitting a sort of a smaller shadow of what your specification says, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So basically, you are saying that uh, the given first condition uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is soundly proven to be under approximate that there exists a path from the given precondition to reach order. But okay. So yeah, maybe we can talk later on this. Yeah. yeah thank you. I, I wonder if you know what fragment of temporal logic your uh, your logic correspond to. Yeah, so this is actually quite interesting. So I mentioned we have um, we started off in a sort of temporal logic um, area, um, which sort of feels like the correct place to start for these kinds of things. Um, so uh, blah, 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 blah. yeah, so relation to temporal logic. Um, so it's interesting because a couple of our specifications we can express in temporal logic um, because. Uh, but it isn't tr strictly true to say that it is more expressive. It's more expressive, so we can express um, our only if our single step, or sorry, our necessary precondition uh, form like this, where we say, th th this is it's clearly true, but the, the problem comes in when, um, so this is the next, sorry, and then the, the multi-step one. Um, but this specification, actually, you can't, as far as we can tell, you can't actually express in temporal logic, purely because you're talking about three program states, potentially, and their relationship to each other. There's a sort of sense that maybe you want to start doing nested, um, these sort of like nested um, expressions. If you've got nominals in your temporal logic, so if you've got some way of talking about particular states, then you will be able to address the third one. Um, because the point is that you have to be able to get from A1 Way to through A and um, being able to say effectively uh, that the state where A holds needs to be the same that leads you on to A2. Whereas standard temporal logic will let you say, well, you can go from A1 to A. So, A1 to, uh, sorry, from A1 to A2, it doesn't require that you have to go through particular A. Yeah, so in. in like, I don't know, the way I think about it is in, um, in linear simple logic, you're sort of looking at one direction, and you can have two program states that you're talking about, but you can't necessarily ensure that there's one directly in between. And that's the problem with the expression. Um, so neither sort of expresses the other. I think, um, uh, I think I, I don't know if we found an example which sort of, I don't know if I can think of it like a concrete example that we want to express, that can't be expressed in, lin in linear temporal logic, but strictly speaking, they they aren't equivalent, or one not, neither subsumes the other. Shall I say? Okay. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one short question. Why, while Benjamin? Uh... Thanks for the talk. Um, in the beginning, you had uh, this predicate that was like access, uh, like you have access to the. Yeah. Can this is this is a predicate in the underlying assertion logic. This isn't part of the the proof logic. No. Um, so we have it's. Um, hold on. Yep. 
of here, right? Um, no, so this is um, the the proof is, is is for necessity specifications. Um, so these ones over here. Um, this exists, yeah, as you say, in the underlying assertion uh, logic, and this is something that we. I think this existed in a previous form of a paper a couple of years ago, but it's because we're primarily concerned with um, you know, how you gain access and who has access to our data, that's where the necessity, the ne the necessity for this, um, this particular uh, assertion came from. But, but then how, but so how do you prove this assertion if you have oh, yeah, so so we don't. Our proof logic is only for our specification our necessity specs, not for our underlying specifications over here. Okay, yeah. I see. Thank you. Okay, let's let's thank Julian again. Yeah. Uh,